Good morning, church family. Trust that this finds you well. This is our fourth Sunday uh, as we are sheltering in place. It's been really encouraging talking to some of you. I'm going to try and uh, continue to keep calling you, and, and uh, I know the elders are doing that as well. Uh, we just want to continue to care for you as best as we can and uh, just encouraged by your responses and how God has provided and your reaching out and um, seeking to care for others. So um, be uh, looking out for an announcement segment after this. Uh, that will be should be the next file in the playlist. And um, with that, we're in Psalm 90. We're going to continue in Psalm 90, and we are going to hit a, a very sobering section today. So I just want you to prepare your heart and your mind for that. I wanted to, I was hoping to, to finish it and get to um, the hopeful part, as I know that this has been uh, tough sledding, um, just to think through the sobriety of it, but just trusting in God's word that it, uh, the wisdom in Ecclesiastes that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of mirth or happiness. Uh, it's good for us to consider these things. That's why God puts it in his word, and especially as a, at a time for uh, as this. So let me read again for us Psalm 90, and then we'll pray and ask God's uh, for God's grace for me, uh, the preacher, and you, the listener. So let's read God's word together. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain seventy years, or if due to strength, eighty years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone, and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger, and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So, teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord. How long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us, and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants, and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you who are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who has no beginning and has no end, you are the Sovereign One, who is not bound by time, yet sovereignly works within time. You are transcendent, and yet very imminent in your care, very near to us. And so, Father, I pray that your nearness would be our good. And so, Father, pray that you would help us to find you to be our dwelling place. And from generation to generation, that we would live in such a way to call others to make you, you their dwelling place to find their home with you. So be compassionate upon us and satisfy us with your loving kindness, especially the loving kindness that you demonstrated on the cross when you sacrificed your only son. 
for sinners like us, and you raised him from the dead on the third day. So be with us as we soberly consider our sin and the effects and consequences of sin in light of you, the holy God. And teach us to number our days so that we might present to you a heart of wisdom. Help me and my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ who are watching this and listening to this to grapple with your word. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, we started our time in this psalm because we wanted to consider how we should think during this time of sheltering in place and and to, to take into account what other people are thinking and to come back to God's word and the mirror of God's word and look long into our own souls as we look into his word and to find truth and wisdom and our God. And so as we come to this psalm, as, as you remember, this is the psalm written by Moses. And this is the oldest psalm in the Psalter. And the context for this, as Moses wrote this, as I suggested to you, is, and we can't be definitive on this, but my guess, my best guess is that this places it right up to the edge that they get to the promised land the first time they send the 12 spies and they reject the promises of God all except for um, Joshua and Caleb and then they get pushed back by God into the wilderness to die to be judged for their sin even Moses and Aaron are not um, excluded from that only those who were under 20 and Joshua and Caleb were able to enter the promised land. Everybody else died. You can remind yourself in Numbers 13 and 14 to read the context again. And as you remember, we estimated about a million people on the conservative end in the nation of Israel. And if that were to be true, the there would need to be about 60 to 70 funerals per day for every day of those 38 years remaining in the wilderness wandering. And in the midst of this, I think Moses, somewhere in this, penned this psalm as a reminder, as a reminder of who God is and who they are before God. And first, we, we saw in verse 1, we, we found that Moses writes that God has been the dwelling place of the Israelites. God has, you have been our dwelling place. You have been our home. And then from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. And therefore, as God is their dwelling place, he is also their eternal dwelling place. This phrase of praise in the Song of Moses, after this, confession of trust that God has been the dwelling place, the home, the place of security, the place of belonging, the tabernacle literally in the middle of the nation of Israel when they camped every time they were wandering. This statement of Moses's in verse 1 and 2 that if God is, if God is our home, if God is in our midst, that's where home is. Home is, is where God is, no matter where we are in the wilderness, no matter how long we've been wandering, God is our dwelling place. And Moses understood what I think the psalmist later on penned in Psalm 73, verse 27 and 28. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge, my, made the Lord God my refuge, then I may tell of all your works. So after this declaration of praise and trust, Moses, Moses shifts to his sobering reality. What he and the Israelites and all peoples who trust in God 
as their dwelling place should remember. But for Moses and the Israelites, what they needed to remember after this phrase of praise is that their eternal God stands sovereignly over the wrecks of time and fleeting humans. And so therefore anything from humans or of humans is insufficient to be their dwelling place. And we talked last week about the inevitability and universality of death for all people. People are mortals, so therefore all people will die. No one on earth will last anywhere close to God. Because to God, a thousand years is like yesterday. Or even shorter than that, a watch in the night. All people will die. Our lives are just a blip a vapor, a here today and gone tomorrow grass, a fading, fleeting wisp of steam of, of cu- steam off of a cup of coffee. All people will die. We're like dust. And God stands over time and all peoples and says to, to people, return to the dust from which you were formed. Everybody will die. He sweeps them away like a flood. They're like grass that withers in the evening. So we talked about that all people will die. This is an inevitability. This happens to all people. No one escapes. This is a fact. It's often said that that it could be said of um, those who deliver babies that they could say to their moms and says, you know, I'm sorry. Your baby has a terminal disease. Well, well, how long does, does he have to live? The parents might say. So 70, maybe 80 years, but this baby's going to die. It doesn't matter how promising, how bright, how flourishing the beginning of life is, like grass in the morning, everybody in the evening of their life will die and wither. That, I think, is readily apparent to all those who would even open their eyes and look around at life, especially now. I think people have a greater sense of their mortality, that they might die. But I think, although that is a great question to be asking, that I think that people often ignore, and that we cannot ignore now with the coronavirus, it's a great opportunity to go and talk to people But the question I think that is missed, that people don't ask that we should, by God's grace, with humility and fear of God, place before them is, why do people die? Why do people die? It's a foregone conclusion that everybody will die. But why do people die? Why is this the inevitable end for all of mankind? Why will all people be swept away like a flood? Why will all people wither and turn back to dust, no matter how bright and flourishing the beginnings are? Well, this is our next section. It begins in verse 7. Why must all people die? Why do all people get swept away? Why do does God say return to the dust? Verse 7. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone, and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear, your fury that is according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we might present to you a heart of wisdom. And in this section, I think Moses writes this section of his psalm so that he and the Israelites and all those who would follow God would remember that the sinfulness of man and the wrath of God due to sinners ought not to be ignored. That we are sinners, and because we're sinners, we deserve the wrath of God, and that ought not to be ignored. Therefore, we must give serious prayer 
for God to open up the eyes of our heart and turn our eyes from empty, vain, worthless things. We are sinful. God is holy. And because he's holy, our sin deserves wrath. That ought not to be ignored. Therefore, we should pray so that God would teach us to number our days. So, verse 7 and 8. We have been consumed by your anger. What, we ask the question, remember, why is it that all people will be swept away like a flood to die and return to the dust? First of all, notice how death is described now by a consumption. For we have been consumed. That word for is the reason. Why is it that people will return to dust and be swept away well, for or because we have been consumed by your anger? So this death, this sweeping away is described as a consumption, being consumed. Sometimes that word is translated finished or used up, come to an end or destroyed. We have been destroyed. We have come to an end. We have been used up. We, have, we are finished because we are finished by God's anger. One preacher said it this way, life is defiantly fragile and fleeting. He is defiantly short. No matter, no matter what advancements we will make in medical technology, every doctor, nurse, surgeon will throw up their hands and give up at some point. They will tap out because there is just, there's nothing more that we can do, they'll say. No matter how good we get, no matter what advancements we will make, everyone will be confronted with all people will be consumed we are being consumed like a fire consumes grass in a field think of the reality of the israelites in the wilderness wandering death after death funeral after funeral one right after the other multiple funerals per day they all fell down and crumpled into death like raggedy dolls that have been propped up to stand but could not stand for long. They all crumpled to the ground. Israelite after Israelite being swept away like fallen leaves in a flood. Israelites walking the dusty wilderness, watching friends, family, and relations return to dust day after day. And again, why was all this happening? Why were they being consumed? They were being consumed by the anger and wrath of God. It's because God was angry and wrathful. This point is highlighted even in the structure of the verse. It's a stair step. It's a chiasm. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, it says, We have been consumed. And then at the end, it's, We have been dismayed. But look at in the middle. We have been consumed by your anger. And by your wrath, we have been dismayed. So this stair step, it takes a step from we have been consumed by your anger, by your wrath, we have been dismayed. And this middle section is where the emphasis lies. God is angry and wrathful. We'll talk about why he's angry and wrathful later, but the fact is the reason why people die, the reason why the Israelites all fell in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb and those who are younger than 20, the reason why the, those people died and why all people die is because of God's wrath and anger. When people die, it is a manifestation of God's wrath. Now, I have to say, it's not the full manifestation of God's wrath. Think about this. Hebrews 9.27 says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so physical death is not the full wrath of God. It is a manifestation of his wrath, according to Psalm 90, but it is not the full manifestation of God's wrath. Listen also to Revelation 20 at the great white throne. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So there's the first death, which is physical death. And then after that, that's not all. It's, there's the second death, which is being, which is uh, when you're thrown into the lake of fire. One chapter later in Revelation 21, verse 8, it says, 
it's not only death and Hades that get thrown into the lake of fire. It says, for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, all people die. All people are swept away in this flood of death because of the wrath and anger of God. But this is not the full wrath and anger of God. But it is the wrath and anger of God nonetheless. We are consumed to death by your anger. And by your wrath, it says, we are dismayed. This word Hebrew in the Hebrew is otherwise translated terrify or disturb. It has the idea of causing anxiety and distress. By your wrath, we are caused to be in anxiety and distress. And rightly so. You can see reflections of that even now. People in distress because they might die as a function of the wrath of God. They might not connect it. But we can, right? We can look at the, the mirror of God's word. We can look at the lens of God's word and, and understand life, how it ought to be understood. And this is what the Israelites and Moses should have understood as they wandered in the wilderness, watching their friends and family and relations just strewn, corpses strewn all over the wilderness. This is the wrath of God. This is, this is a manifestation of his anger towards us. And we are terrified. What can we do? They might have asked. How is it that we can escape? Well, we'll talk about that more later. But... Death, all people die because God is angry and wrathful. So the next question is, why is God angry and wrathful? Remember we talked about that? Why is God angry and wrathful? Well, look at verse 8. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Why is God angry and wrathful? Is it because he's, he just got up on the wrong side of his heavenly bed? Is he just grumpy? Is he just hungry, so hangry? Is it, what is it? Why is he so angry and wrathful? Is he just a cosmic killjoy? What is it? What is it that makes God so angry and wrathful? Well, verse 8 says, it's because our iniquities and our secret sins, because of our iniquities are before him and our secret sins are in the light of his presence. It's, it's, it's our sin. It's my sin. It's your sin. It's the Israelite sin, right? If we go back to the context, it was their unbelief. It was their unbelief and distrust of God and calling him a liar that God said we would go into the promised land and even though there are the Canaanites there, he would rout them and we would win a victory over them. They should have seen that in how they had victories coming from Egypt and all the way through. But they didn't trust him. And because of their sin, they were dying in the wilderness. And not only just their sins, their secret sins. So first, a few things to notice. Notice that our good deeds don't factor in. Notice that there is no like balancing. It's the reason why God is wrathful and angry is because of sins our, our iniquities and our secret sins. Notice that there is no, no caveat. And so it's unless you've done really, really good, unless you've been really done a lot of good deeds, our good deeds don't factor in. What makes God angry and wrathful is our sin and our good deeds don't cover them up at all. Isaiah 64, 6 describes it this way, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And that word in the Hebrew is really graphic and gross. It would be the menstrual garments. 
All our righteous deeds to God are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our, our iniquities like the wind take us away. Or very familiar passage, but one that needs to be meditated on is Romans 10, uh, 3, verses 10 through 23. Quoting from the Old Testament, As it is written, there is none righteous. There is not even one there's none who has a right standing with God. No one can say, you know what, I, I, I've done all these things, God, so y you'll give me a pass. I know you're angry with everybody else, but you know, you can give me a pass because I am righteous in your sight. I have done right by you. I have treated you and honored you as God. No, there's not even one. There's no one who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. We just have to stop and, 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 and ask ourselves, is this what we consistently believe? There is no one who does good. The nicest person that you ever know, the cutest little kid that you ever know, there is no good kid. There is no good person, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. Their, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of, pe path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So first of all, as we think about this, why is God angry and wrathful? It's because of our sin, our secret sins. And notice that our good deeds don't factor in at all. Our good deeds are like filthy rags before him. There is no one who does good, not even one. No one righteous. Secondly, nothing, absolutely nothing is hid from God's sight. You can see that in the secret sins. Man, don't you wish in your sinful self, in my sinful self, that there are sins that, that can be made secret and kept secret. There, there are sins that, that, uh, that you sin that people don't know, that I don't know, the elders don't know, the deacons don't know. Maybe even your spouse or your closest friend, they don't know. There are these secret pet sins that you keep hidden away in the dark recesses of your life. And you bring them out when you think it's safe, when you think it's hidden and concealed. But your secret sins and my secret sins, this passage says, <clears throat> your secret sins are in the light of your presence. You want to try and keep it in the dark? It is in the broad daylight of God's blazing presence. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All things are open and laid bare. There's nothing hidden. Just think back on our time in Psalm 32. Remember that? How blessed are those whose sins have been forgiven. David understood that while he tried to keep silent about his sins, he tried to keep a hush over people talking about what he did. He tried to hide his sin. He tried to ignore his sin rather than acknowledge his sin before God. And in Psalm 32, he says, when he did that, there is no forgiveness. And the heavy hand of God's discipline was upon him. And thankfully, his heart wasn't hardened. He softened and, and broke before God and humbled himself and did not hide his sin, but he confessed it. And if you don't want to keep silent about your sins or hide your sins and ignore your sins, but rather acknowledge them to God, a la Psalm 32, then this passage says in verse 12, you must be reading, meditating, and dealing with and obeying God's word, the word of God. It is the word of God that is living and active and sharper than two, any two-edged sword that will cut in between 
your motives and your thinking and show you where you fit in terms of God and his word. And it will show you the path of healing and peace and forgiveness and restoration in Christ. So, but nothing is hidden from God's sight. Everything is open and laid bare. On Thursday, if you had a chance to listen to our devotion, we talked about how <clears throat> David describes God as knowing everything about him. And even though we're referencing Psalm 139, not in the exact context and tone that David wrote in Psalm 139, David loved it that God knew everything about him. But he does speak about a God who knows everything, absolutely everything. Listen to it again in verses 1 through 4. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I uh, sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. Just a couple things, even our thoughts. As a reminder, you understand my thought from afar. Even in the English language, you kind of see, um, we have this uh, relationship between seeing clearly and understanding. So, for example, if someone is explaining to you and uh, explaining something difficult to you that you didn't understand, and now the light bulb turns on, see a, a reference to light, you say, oh, you can either say, oh, I, I understand it now, or you can say, oh, I see, I see. So seeing and understanding are related. And so when he says that, uh, David says that God can understand his thought from afar. I think about my recent time with uh, uh, Elder Andrew at his, um, his, uh, his uh, optometrist clinic, his office. He examined my eyes and, um, and uh, you know, there are things that are clear and not clear, one or two and, you know, all those things. And thankfully, uh, God has given me a, a sight where I, I can see clearly when things are far. And I don't have to guess, and it's not blurry, and it's not, you know, um, fuzzy to me at, 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 a, at a distance. With God is infinitely so. He doesn't, he doesn't have to come close and, and peer in. He can just look back and everything, he can, understands your thoughts what you're thinking from afar. He knows the words that you're going to say before they even hit from your brain to your tongue. Matthew 12, 36, absolutely nothing is hidden from God's sight. Our secret sins are in the light of his presence. Matthew 12, 36 says, but I, can, but I tell you, Jesus says, that every careless word, every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. You know what this says? You know those words that you just kind of fly off, fly out of your mouth, you just don't even think about it? Careless words of unkindness, careless words of selfishness, careless words of, I don't know, whatever, anger. All those careless words that you speak, notice, are accounted for, and you have to give an accounting in the day of judgment. Not only are careless words, it's everything, every thought, every action. And again, in that passage in Revelation 20, where it pictures the last judgment, the great white throne judgment, in verses 11 through 13 of chapter 20, he talks about these books and the book of life. These books are given in Revelation to help us understand that everything in our life is being recorded. I imagine there's a, a, a time stamp, a and a date and a exacting accounting of what we have said, what we've done, how we've thought, our motives. And it reads this, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from these, from the things were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades 
gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. There is no secret deed, secret thought, secret sin that you and I have that is not laid bare and in the light of God's presence. And it's because of our sin, our secret sins and our iniquities that God is wrathful and angry. It's sobering, isn't it? Let's say that you can keep all your sins contained. Let's say that you could keep it hidden from every single person in the world. Everybody thinks you're great. Everybody thinks you're nice. Everybody thinks you're spiritual. Everybody thinks you're a Christian. Everybody thinks you're going to heaven. But you know, if you have secret sins, even though the whole world might love you, what Psalm 90 verse 8 says is God is angry with you and his wrath comes upon you because of your secret sins and he sees it all. As he continues to describe it, he says in verses 9 and 10, for all our days have declined in, fur in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. They were due to strength 80 years, yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. This is the Ecclesiastes portion of Psalm 90 in my mind. He's describing that the difficulty and the futility of life in a, a, a sin-stained world living in a sin-stained body living in a world that is controlled by the prince of the power of the air. They decline in, in, in God's fury. Again, connecting that thought of being consumed by his anger and our, our days decline in his fury. And he says, when he, we have finished our years like a sigh. Literally, it's we have finished our years like a groan. One preacher says, "Life ends with a uh, with a groan." Uh, be prepared. This is <clears throat> this is a, a harsh, sobering reality as he describes it. Life ends with a groan. The end of life is like an extended sigh of pain. Life doesn't necessarily get more pleasant as you get older. Life doesn't get more pleasant, but he says, "I am realizing this more and more. The pains multiply." difficulty sleeping at the end you die and even if you are fortunate to live long enough to die of old age the end of your life will be a drawn out groan of agony if you didn't like that description consider the words of god penned through solomon as he looked uh, and wrote from the end of his life in ecclesiastes 12 remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say. And this is the section, if you know Ecclesiastes 12, I remember Pastor Galen preached this to us as he came back and visited after his retirement. As he reflected on his life, he reflected with us in Ecclesiastes 12. And it struck me, this is the, the poetic, metaphorical description that Solomon gives of growing old and our bodies decaying. But notice how he describes those days of getting old. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say. So he says, when, the, when your years draw near, these are evil calamitous days. Why? Because the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. In that day, the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop. The grinding ones, your teeth stand idle because they are few. Those who look through the windows grow dim. Your eyesight, uh, you can't see as well as you used to. The doors on the, sh on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. You're, you can't hear as well as you used to, and one will arise at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. You'll, 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 it's hard to sleep. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. 
you're not as adventurous and and um, and uh, you, you just know that you're just very fragile and so the places where you used to flip off of and jump off of now now they bring you terror you don't want to go up in those high places the almond tree blossoms talking about the uh, the white hair, the gray hairs come, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the caperberry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed and the, the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. Does that sound familiar? And the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. That's how Solomon described it. Moses described it. All our years have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. If we live 70 years, that's great. 80 years, if due to strength, anything beyond 80, those are bonus days. Yet, even if you live to that age, yet their pride is but labor and sorrow for soon it is gone, we fly away. And Solomon would add in the background of this song, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So he finishes out his, his discussion. We are sinners before a holy God because of our sin, this holy God is rightfully, just, justly angry and wrathful. There is no sin that we can hide from him. There is no good deeds that will cover over our sin and iniquity. And because of that, we live in a life and, full, uh, and next to, as our neighbors, sinners the same. And we all are declining in God's fury. We all die. Everything is vanity apart from him. And so he ends with this question in verse 11. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? You and I, we don't, we don't understand how angry God is against sin. We, we, we come close. We come close when we rightfully think about the cross and God's sacrifice of his sinless son and pouring out his full wrath upon sin for all those who would believe. We come close, but still, it is, it is a mystery. Who really considers the full weight and power of how angry God is with sin? Who really takes proper stock of how fearful we ought to be? We who are less than dust, sinners railing against the omnipotent holy God. Who really takes proper stock of how fearful we ought to be? One man tried, and I think has done well beyond what most people have. But even still, this person... Um, still does not understand the fullness, but I think what his description is helpful to us. And this is a section of Jonathan Edwards' sermon, his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now listen to this. As he reflects on trying to understand, trying to understand the power of of God's anger and his fury according to the fear that is due to him. Quote, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear you in his sight. You are ten thousand times as abominable in his sight as the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely, more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but in his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. 
it is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not get uh, that you did not get to hell the last night that you were suffered to wake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep and there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning but that God's hand has held you up there is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God provoking his pure eye by your sinful wicked manner of attending his solemn worship yea there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell O oh, sinner consider the fearful danger you are in it is a great furnace of wrath a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that god whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell you hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder it would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of almighty god one moment but you must suffer it to all eternity there will be no end to this exquisite horrible mis misery when you look forward you shall see along forever a boundless duration before you which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance any end any mitigation any rest at all you will know certainly that you must wear out long ages millions and of millions of ages in wrestling with this almighty merciless vengeance and then when you have done so when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner you will know that all is but a point to what remains so that your punishment will indeed be infinite oh who can express what the state of a soul in such circumstance is all that we can possibly say about it gives but a very feeble faint representation of it it is inexpressible and inconceivable for quote who knows the power of god's anger how dreadful is the state of those that are daily and hourly in danger of this great wrath and infinite misery but this is the dismal case of every soul in this congregation that has not been born again however moral and strict sober and religious they may be otherwise be oh that you would consider it whether you be young or old who understands and gives proper weight of God's anger for sin and the fear the fear that is due to him because of his fury over sin so that's why Moses concludes and will conclude this sober sermon for this morning that's why Moses concludes this so teach us to number our days that we might may present to you a heart of wisdom As I've considered this, there are two types of days that we can number. Two types of days that we can number. First type, the days that have passed. The days that you've lived since you've been conceived, since life began for you in conception. Those are the days that you can number. That's one of the types of days. The days that have passed, they have all been gracious gifts of God undeserved mercy undeserved grace every day every single day mercy for not immediately and justly receiving the penalty of sin each time we sin each time we don't love God with all our heart each time we make ourselves or something or someone more important and valued and treasured of God every day every moment has been a gracious act of God it is his hand that holds us up over the fiery pit of hell those days that have passed have been God's hands who hold us up and if you are in Christ it is God's hand and Christ's hands that hold us up it's grace for all the undeserved kindnesses from God 
sunshine, rain, friends, family, health, food, shelter, clothes, God's word, the gospel, calls to repentance. And if you're not a believer here, every one of those things, everything that you have in your life that is not an eternal misery is far better than what you deserve. And it is a kindness that God has been patient with you. And I pray that it is his kindness that leads you to repentance. That you would start to understand in these days where death is more looming to you, how kind God has been to you and that his kindness would lead you to repentance, to turn from your sin, to turn from your iniquities and your secret sins and recognize that you deserve an eternal wrath from him. That's what you justly deserve. But you can turn to him and call out to him like Moses does in the end of this psalm, which we won't get to this Sunday. But he calls out to him, Oh God, have compassion. Be sorry for your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness. God has loved you. You who don't believe in him, you who are not a Christian, God has loved you with an everlasting love and a loving kindness par excellence when he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. That wrath that you deserve for every single one of your sins that have been accounted for in his books, they have been put upon Christ who did never, he never sinned and died on your behalf if you believe, if you don't reject him, if you don't push him away. And I pray that you would turn to him. These are all undeserved kindnesses from God. And these are the days that you can number. God has given me how many thousands of days that I don't deserve. Days filled with kindness and not what I deserve. That that would lead you to repentance. For we who are believers, you can number those days too. You can number the kindnesses that God has given to you, but we have, as I mentioned, the kindness par excellence, the ultimate kindness, the ultimate loving kindness. Each day we get to fellowship in the progress of the gospel, not only in our lives and the lives of others. We can have the confidence to know that as a believer, as a child of God, whatever God calls us to, no matter how much labor or toil it costs, we can know that our labor is not in vain. That we can keep on doing that which is good and godly and pursuing of righteousness. We can number those days that God has allowed us to do that. Not only that, we can number our days in light of eternal bliss. Even though we don't know when we might die and when God will call us home, maybe tomorrow, maybe in 10, 20 years, we don't know that, excuse me. But those days numbered in light of the eternal days that are, are to come for us because of Christ. See, no matter what suffering comes, no matter what suffering and toil and that we go through in this life, they are but, in Paul's words, momentary light afflictions, which are working for us in eternal weight of glory. Listen to what um, this one Puritan says. His name's James Michael. He says this, Sovereign Lord, what I most desired you have denied, yet I praise you. On what account I know not, yet I praise you. You have done it. That silences me. Your will makes it indisputable and renders it my indispensable duty to your wise determinations. Hitherto, I have had no complaint on the conduct of providence, nor shall I complain until all the mazes are explained. Do then all your counsel, though all my counsel should come to nothing. Can a person expect favors from God who will not wait for God's way and time? But what does it matter how the affairs of a present world go if the interests of the next world are secured? The weather vane is whirled about with every blast, but the iron spire is still at rest because it cannot be displaced. So what does it matter 
though the outward man decays, if the inner man grows? What does it matter though the temporal condition be perplexed if the conscience is possessed of spiritual peace? I praise you that you interpose your providence even in disappointing my dearest plans and do not give me up to the blind desires of my own heart and to wander at random in counsels of my own. I can resolve the present case into nothing but your will. Yet I rejoice more to resign your will and to be submissive to your disposal than to have my will in every point perform. This is the only way my private capacity that I can glorify you. See, we need to present God a heart of wisdom like this. To say to him, Sovereign Lord, these are the things that I most desired, and you have denied them all, yet I praise you. Um, the reason why you've denied me, I don't know, yet I praise you. You have done it, so I silence myself. That's the heart of wisdom that we should apply. So we can number one type of day, those days past. As an unbeliever, you should number your days as undeserved gifts of mercy, days that you have not deserved, life and breath that you have not deserved. As believers, those on top of the days of fellowship in Christ, fellowship with believers, the privilege to be ambassadors for Christ, to carry the treasure of the gospel in the clay pots of our lives, and then to number our days that have passed in light of eternal days to come. The second type of day that I think that we can number, not our future days unless they're eternal days, but just the present day. We can only number and be assured to be able to count that day. I don't know whether I'm going to wake up tomorrow, and neither do you, but God knows. So this is the day, apart from the past days that we have lived, that he's graciously granted to us in his mercy. But this day, this day you can count that God has given to you. This is another day that God has given to you. So, whether believer or unbeliever, our response to Surely, the heart of wisdom that we present before God that numbers these days, just day one by one by one as God gives them to us, is to not waste the time that God has given to us. Listen to Second Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. And working together with him, God, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He says, I'll listen to you and I'll help you at the acceptable time and I'll help you at the day of salvation. And today is that day. Listen, unbeliever, today is the acceptable time when God will listen to you. He'll listen to your prayers. He'll listen to your cries. He won't reject you if you come to Christ, his son. He'll help you if you cry out to him for salvation, today is that day. Don't waste this day. Listen to Psalm 95, verse 6 through 11. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, Truly they shall not enter into my rest. Today, today, if the Spirit of God is working in your heart and convicting you from the word of God that you have heard, Today, don't harden your heart. Don't be like the Israelites who distrusted God and hardened their hearts against God and complained against Him, and they died and were loathed for 40 years by God. 
Let's not waste the days that God gives us. Psalm 119, verse 37 and 38. Make this your prayer. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity, emptiness, worthlessness, and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence or fear for you. And we'll close with this. Charles Spurgeon says, as it pertains to not wasting our days, Life is very short, but a great deal may be done. Our Lord Jesus Christ in three years saved the world. Some of his followers in three years have been the means of saving many and many a soul. It was a short life that Luther had to do his work in. If I remember rightly, he was hard upon 50 before he began to preach the truth at all. A hopeful sign for some of you who have wasted your young days. So there have been men of 60 that have yet achieved a life's work before they had slept and gone their way. After all, time is long or short as you like to make it so. So whether you are 13, 30, 73, 83, if God gives you this next day, number it. Number it along all the days that God has given you in his kindness. Number it and use it for his glory. Spend it the way that he wants you to spend it. Don't be like the Israelites who ignored God, complained against him, were ungrateful, and so on and so forth, who hardened their hearts. May God help us to consider rightly, soberly, these truths. We are all going to die. And the reason why we die is because of our sin. And because of our sin, God is angry and wrathful. But what we'll cover next time is this God who is angry can still be your dwelling place. He is a God who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He forgives iniquities, transgressions, and sins. This God you can cry out to today. May God help us to see him rightly and to love him for it. Let's pray together. O Sovereign Lord, you are a holy God and we are sinners before you. And we don't understand the anger that is due to you and the fear that is due to you because of our sin. Oh, help us in your mercy to help us to taste yet a little bit more clearly how great sinners we are. But in your grace, O oh God, in your kindness, in your love, help us all the more as we taste the bitterness of our sin, and rightly so, that our taste of our, of our souls will be overwhelmed with the sweetnesses of Christ and his death and resurrection for sinners. That we would taste and see and know that he is good and that he would satisfy our souls for endless days. So I pray that you would powerfully work in our hearts through your word. Be gracious to us, O God. Have compassion upon us. And help us to utilize the time that you've given to us in a way that lasts and impacts an eternal way. Help it not to be empty or vain or for nothing. Help it to be an eternal impact and bring eternal fruit to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.